down, which is great uh, as the number of vaccinations have increased. So uh, we see the correlation between the two and, uh, and hopefully it continues to be that way. And we don't catch any kind of new variant or any kind of uh, recession back in uh, 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 new cases and so forth. But we have pockets across the country at different places. Um, but overall, it's, it's looking much better than it was a year ago. Yeah, and I, that, yeah, please. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, I, you know, we, we hear news reports uh, about, you know, India and how the challenge uh, that's, that you guys are facing right now. No, the, you know, the challenges are very high across India and uh, there, are a lot of, there have been a lot of rise in uh, COVID patients. And now we are affected with one more problem that is blood fungus, uh, which is really causing a lot of trouble. Uh, both, you know, for the, uh, from the healthcare sector and as well as for other people also. And the vaccination has been good in India, uh, but uh, the problem is the number is, uh, especially South India, uh, the number is enormously increasing. It's a complete lockdown now from past almost a month. And uh, I don't know when, you know, this uh, will be out of uh, this pandemic. Yes, yeah, it, it's, um, it's definitely a challenge and uh, uh, we, we are experiencing now a plateau of vaccinations and where the vaccine hesitancy has now come into play that we, we were predicting and looking for all along. Um, and unfortunately, there's just a segment of the population that's, uh, that doesn't have the, the trust or just doesn't want to do it for one reason or another. So um, that's the, the challenge that we have now is trying to convince them to accept the vaccination. Right. And uh, as far as you know, our India goes, uh, you know, there have been a lot of challenges for the pharmacy fraternity. Uh, but especially, you know, the COVID has really opened the eyes of the healthcare sector in the country. Uh, because as you know, um, USA is fine. It was already established. But in India, you know, the community pharmacy and other uh, units of pharmacy, uh, you know, they were uh, not completely included in the healthcare sector. But now, you know, the pharmaceutical uh, industry and as well as the people from uh, pharmaceutical fraternity, they are really doing excellent. It can be healthcare Good. or it can be giving some kind of, you know, the, uh, you know, the counseling to them. Uh, so the, now uh, India has realized, you know, the importance of pharmacists. And um, uh, that's why we had requested to do kindly address our uh, people. Uh, because, you know, there is some, some kind of hiccup in the mind of, you know, the, I can say the doctors. Uh, because uh, like uh, across the world, they always feel that, you know, they are the first rate citizens and then followed by, you know, the uh, pharmaceutical people and nursing and all. Uh, because you are, yours is one of the oldest, uh, uh, you know, the organizations in uh, USA. And in India, it started, uh, you know, it was there in the beginning, but uh, as you know, a team, it started uh, very recently, around two, in 2007. Uh, so we are hopeful that uh, our people will get a lot of benefits from your uh, advice and talk. Thank you. I, I, I hopefully we can uh, create some insight and, uh, and utilize some of the successes that we've had. And, and uh, it could be somewhat of a, a foundation or a platform uh, for you and your group as well. Thank you. And uh, before you know the other people join, a uh, small information to you, uh, Mr. Brian. Uh, you know, the, uh, ours is an organization uh, which is called the ACPI, Association yes. of Community Pharmacists of India. And uh, it was started in 2007, but uh, we could start it uh, in a little uh, uh, more uh, practical way very recently. Uh, but we have the backup of uh, a lot of organizations, like it is from Indian uh, Railway Pharmacist Association. We have Government Pharmacy Officers Association. Uh, so we have high HPA. Uh, so many associations are there. When it comes to community pharmacy, uh, yes, we have to uh, change a little, change a lot, and uh, we have to cultivate that uh, professional way of uh, dispensing and uh, uh, you know uh, doing the professional activities. I understand. Yeah, challenges all the time, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. Um. President Joshi, if, uh, if you don't mind, uh, is my audio clear enough uh, on your end? Yes, yes, the audio is very clear and even the video okay, also. Good. And in fact, you are looking very smart, other than you know the, your photo in uh, our website. 
I can I can try to look the part. That's, that'd be about it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Vinay, can you check uh, whether uh, Dr. Nagapa has joined? The national uh, Nagapa sir is here. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, sir, welcome to you. Thank you. Sir, yeah, yeah, tell me now. Uh, around uh, 45 watching on YouTube and we got 50 here. So... Uh, we can start uh, so that people will join. Yes. Uh, why to waste the time? Uh, we, hopefully we can, uh, yeah. Um, uh, we can go ahead. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, a hearty welcome to all the delegates, the guests for joining us today for this webinar conducted by Association of Community Pharmacists of India, ACPI, South India. ACPI is a non-profit professional organization started with an aim to provide patient safety by pharmaceutical care. The society was launched in the year 2007 with an objective to assist practicing pharmacists and to help patients to use medication safely and effectively. So webinar will be on the topic of uh, overview of community pharmacy practice in the US. Today, community pharmacists play an important role in any country as they take responsibility for patients' medicine-related needs for access to healthcare. However, in India, only the supply of medicines remains the core activity of community pharmacists. Most community pharmacists in the country still hardly offer patient-oriented service. The role of pharmacists in the community and with it, their medicine management may change in the wake of rapid growth of domestic medicine output and national healthcare expenditure. This webinar seeks to discuss the community pharmacy practice in US and sketches its education and, pros education and training in future pros prospects. So now I call upon uh, Dr. Hanuman Tacha Joshi, President, ACPI South President, Karnataka, to welcome the gathering. Uh, thank you, Pavitra. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, a hearty welcome to everyone uh, for you know the much-awaited uh, uh, webinar on overview of community pharmacy practice in the US. 
and i take this opportunity to welcome uh, mr brian caswell uh, president national community pharmacist association usa uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, for coming here to enlighten uh, the pharmacists across uh, india uh, what exactly is community pharmacy and how it is being practiced in us a hearty welcome to you uh, mr brian thank you dr uh, joshi and, and president joshi i appreciate it it's it's a great honor uh, to be able to um, address you guys today so uh, thank you for the invitation thank you i'll and grab I the also, share screen oh, go yeah. ahead yeah, uh, one second uh, yeah yeah, that's uh, so okay. also, yeah, I also welcome uh, uh, the national president, Professor Anand Nayak Nagapa, uh, for all his uh, support for conducting the webinars and making you know the uh, team very active. A hearty welcome to Dr. Nagapa, and I also welcome uh, uh, our uh, mentor and you know the guide, uh, the person who is exactly behind you know for all the activities, uh, Professor N. Udupa, who is the executive director of ACPI, and I also welcome uh, my friends, uh, you know the from various organizations. Uh, that is all india state government pharmacy officers association uh, karnataka state government pharmacy officers association karnataka Chemi chemist and dentist association uh, then indian railways pharmacist association we have govardhan with us i have to welcome to you mr govardhan and uh, department of pharmacy uh, cftri then esi uh, of association uh, then indian hospital pharmacist association and we also have dr pavan kumar uh, who is the vice president of uh, uh, telangana and uh, andhra chapter of uh, south india Dr. Arul Kumaran, the Secretary of ACPI, and as well as the President of uh, ACPI Kerala, and our uh, senior leader, Dr. V. Gopal, uh, the President of ACPI Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. And I also welcome uh, Sri Ashok Swami Heror, a very vibrant and uh, a very active pharmacist uh, in South India, who have been very instrumental in uh, doing a lot of uh, campaignings for the sake of pharmacists. A hearty welcome to you. And uh, Mr. Uh, K. V. Gopinath, uh, an advisor to the ACPI, a practicing uh, pharmacy officer. And our dynamic secretary, Dr. Srikanth, uh, who is the secretary of ACPI, and, um, and all your friends. And I am very sorry if I have uh, forgotten some names. We are hearty welcome to you. And um, we are very eager to listen to uh, the talk of uh, Mr. Brian Caswell. Uh, so we are very happy. And we have been conducting various webinars uh, you know, once in a while. Uh, it is uh, to bring the people together and to make you know, an united team and to work for the profession that is the idea. At the same time, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, I would like to mention our deep condolences for some of, you know, the senior leaders who lost their lives in the past one month, very seniors due to Corona. And um, that's what I wanted to tell you and a hearty welcome to you. And before uh, Brian Castle starts, I request Dr. Uh, Srikant to kindly uh, introduce the speaker today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Now I call upon uh, Dr. Shrikant, Secretary ACPI Karnataka, to introduce today's speaker to all of us. Uh, Shrikant, are you there? Uh, okay, uh, you go ahead, uh, Pavitra. With, uh, yes, sir. Okay, can you read the profile of uh, Mr. Brian Castro? Yes, sir. So, today's speaker we have amidst us Dr. Um, Mr. Brian Caswell, president of Walker Drug in Baxter Springs, KS, is a University of Kansas School of Pharmacy graduate in 1987. He owns four stores in SC, KS, and SWMO and is the current president of the National Community Pharmacists Association, NCPA. Mr. Caswell serves as a board member for NCPA's Innovation Center. The Kansas Pharmacy Foundation is a past president of a Kansas Pharmacists Association and also serves as a lead network facilitator and luminary for CPESNKS. So a hearty welcome to you, sir. Really looking forward for your talk. So uh, you can take over now, sir. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Righty. Okay. Thank you, President Joshi. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to present to you today uh, to the Association of Community Pharmacists of India, a South Indian branch, upon the practice of community pharmacy within the United States. Good evening to everyone. My name is Brian Caswell, president of the National Community Pharmacists Association here in the United States. 
I greatly appreciate your attendance today, and I'll be covering several topics and issues of the day surrounding the practice of community pharmacy and the challenges that we face, along with some victories and advancement of our profession, and also, more importantly, opportunities in order to serve our patients and their healthcare outcomes. And I appreciate the bio that kind of gives a little bit of a, um, of a background of, of what I have been involved with and what I'm involved with now. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is uh, take a brief moment and kind of show you as well um, the, uh, my, the stores that I own and my teams. So you can kind of get a visual understanding of, uh, of you know, maybe a feel for, for uh, who you're talking to more or less. And so um, I have four stores, like, you, like it was mentioned earlier in Southeast Kansas, which is Kansas is the state that's centrally located within the United States, a very rural state uh, as well. And then we have one store in uh, Southwest Missouri, another rural state that borders right up against Kansas. So as you can see here, this is our, our team, uh, an outside exterior of our, um, our stores as well. And uh, we're, uh, we're very proud to be um, the local leaders uh, and also a healthcare center for our patients. So just wanna give you that visual perspective. As well, I might give you just a brief background of how I came to become president of uh, NCPA. And, and how that really occurred is that um, I, um, I graduated in 1987 uh, with a degree in pharmacy. It was before the Farm D degree that uh, we have uh, nationwide here now. So I have a bachelor's in pharmacy. Uh, I, I went to work for a, a national a chain drug store that was located within a, um, a grocery marketplace. Worked there for eight years. And uh, my father-in-law, uh, future father-in-law, and, and became my father-in-law, had a store in Baxter Springs, Kansas, called Walker Drug. And uh, the name there is his name. His name was Edwin Walker. And unfortunately, uh, he passed away and I st stepped in and took over the family business. Consequently, after that, uh, a few years later, I had an opportunity to purchase a, an existing store in Cherryville, Kansas. And that became Cherryville Pharmacy and open up another new pharmacy in Galena, Kansas called Four States Pharmacy. Uh, our two owners that you'll see are, I see, I should say are, our pharmacists in charge uh, within those two stores wanted to get into ownership as well. And so uh, my business partner that I have within Cherryvale and Four States, along with our PICs, uh, bought CJ Pharmacy and established that here just only about four or five years ago. And so my, my, um, my story really kind of takes on a national uh, sense after I became president of the Kansas Pharmacists Association and being um, a fairly active uh, advocacy group within the state on both state and national elections, uh, I had an opportunity to meet some uh, potential candidates and uh, I helped one of those candidates uh, uh, campaign for a congressional seat against a very um, uh, well-known uh, former Olympian athlete and uh, who was a representative in Congress at the time. And this candidate failed, uh, but she was grateful. And she tried again two years later and she was able to unseat a, a 10 term uh, uh, sitting Congressman, which garnered a lot of national attention. And she gave a lot of that credit in, in essence is to myself and rallying, rallying uh, community pharmacists within the state of Kansas uh, to help her with her campaign and to bring healthcare front and center. She had a background in healthcare for herself as well. That allowed me to, uh, to kind of catch the attention of the NCPA uh, who asked me if I would be considering of uh, a position within their national organization, which I was very interested in. And uh, what happened was I ran for that seat and was elected. Uh, the, the role in, uh, in leadership within NCPA from the beginning uh, to a final end is about a 14 year commitment if you withstand all the elections. We have five vice presidents that are elected each year and they advance upward. And then we have six board members on NCPA. And then after uh, your 
your period of time there, you're usually asked to run for president, which I did and won. And I'm actually in my second term of president, which is unusual. Usually it's just a one year appointment, uh, but due to COVID uh, during our, uh, our period of time that we had, which was right in the middle of, of my presidency, uh, we decided that we would go ahead and, and try to allow me to fulfill my duties one more time in the midst of COVID as, as you can imagine, many of you and our li all of our lives were kind of upended. And so I was grateful to have the opportunity to serve in the second year. My term ends this October at our annual meeting, which we will have in Charleston, South Carolina. So, so that's my background. And um, I, I'll go ahead and jump on into the presentation here very quickly. So um, NCPA is considered the voice of community pharmacy. It was established in 1898 uh, as, the, as the National Community Pharmacy Association. And we are a voice for 21,000 independent community pharmacies. And together, we represent over $75 billion of healthcare in the marketplace, and we employ more than 250,000 people across the country. This is, I think, very important as we see two aspects of NCPA's presence uh, and membership opportunities for, uh, for the pharmacists, or independent community pharmacy owners across the country. One is that it's a fairly substantial uh, dollar amount. We see quite a few patients. Uh, we probably fill around, right around 40% of all the prescriptions in the United States. And then we employ enough individuals uh, within the states uh, and within our local communities as well to uh, create a presence within the communities. And along with that, the idea that uh, we interact with our patients and have a great relationship with our patients. Therefore, I think we're considered, I would say, air quote, influencers as the, so, as the uh, social media world uh, calls it. So, um, so with that, we, um, we have a lot of uh, legacy uh, within the advocacy world. And, uh, and that was my path. And, uh, and we still uh, continue to do that today. As we survey our members, advocacy is probably our biggest asset to membership. So looking at independent pharmacy today, uh, what, is a, what is an average independent pharmacy uh, look like? And uh, each individual owner averages about 2.1 uh, stores uh, per owner. And uh, each one of those stores fills roughly around 57,000 prescriptions in a year. It's evenly distributed between new and renewed prescriptions. The uh, average cost is around $55.86. And as you probably are well aware, we have a, a much a very wide uh, degree of cost within that, uh, within that number of prescriptions. I'll give you an example. We have a lot of generics. It's 90% of our dispensing. Uh, that is much lower than 5586. And then we have some brand names, brand name drugs, which represent around 10% of our overall prescriptions. And uh, the average cost on them is quite a bit higher. So, uh, but with that 90-10 uh, perspective, the average cost comes right around a little under $56. Now, when we look at the pay sources, um, that's where medications are being paid for and being covered by, uh, this is probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that community pharmacists here in the United States face. Basically, we have three different types of uh, pay sources. The first one, the larger one for community pharmacy, is the government program. We have Medicaid, and we have Medicare Part D. Medicaid is the assistance that is state-based. So in, for instance, here in Kansas, we have a Kansas Medicaid, and it's, it's really determined on uh, income levels. So low-income level individuals who need assistance is covered under Medicaid. Medicare Part D actually covers those who are elderly, who are retired, and those who are under disability. And together, those groups uh, represent about 55% of the payer source that we have here in the United States. Other third-party programs uh, consist of commercial insurance, which is normally uh, supplied by your employer. Not all employers offer healthcare coverage and therefore prescription drug coverage, 
but a vast majority and the, and the larger um, businesses themselves um, do offer that. And that represent, rem, represents about 35% of the prescriptions that's covered in community pharmacy. The last 10% is usually cash. Um, some of those that may be also uh, tied to some uh, independent um, uh, cards, uh, prescription drug uh, supplements from the drug, various drug manufacturers, but mostly it's a cash uh, type system. So within this group, within the, the government and the other third party commercial insurance, we have um, a group of insurance or there's a uh, prescription drug insurance that's called pharmacy benefit managers. And those pharmacy benefit managers are just that. They manage the pharmacy benefit within a patient's healthcare. Usually they are subcontractors within the major insurers themselves. But as pharmacies are contracted with the PBMs, uh, we, we directly uh, negotiate a contract with them and the challenges there uh, are, are pretty great as the, uh, the squeeze from the national coverage of these PBMs uh, gets smaller over the time period. Uh, our margins continue to erode and uh, it's difficult to operate a, <clears throat> a pharmacy, which is actually two things. It's a, cl it's a clinic, but it's also a business. And so from our perspective is that we have to have the business side in order to uh, support the clinical side and the opportunities that we're able to give to our patients. As successful as the business is, uh, most independent owners who are wanting very much to be involved with a patient's healthcare is able to invest his profit back into that business and within the clinic to support his patients. And so that cycle is what we um, rely upon for continued coverage and for actually advancing the uh, clinical aspect to our, our patients. So as we look at the marketplace within the United States, uh, this is a, uh, a five-year spread. Our latest data only goes out to 2019 uh, as the, the data is lagging a little bit because of uh, the coronavirus. And, and uh, you will see that it's pretty much steady uh, across the board. We see a very slight decrease in independence, and those are locally owned independents, uh, where there's a slight increase uh, within the traditional chains, which uh, you might know as like uh, CVS and Walgreens. Uh, then there's also a supermarket, which is what I worked within. I worked within a, a, a company called Kroger and they owned a, a small chain called uh, Dillon's. And I was there for eight years and had a wonderful opportunity and experience there to grow my, uh, uh, my clinical skills and at the same time, uh, get my managerial skills before taking on Walker Drug. And then finally, uh, we had a, a mass merchant, um, which is the Walmarts, the Targets uh, and of the world. And so as you can see, um, the, the vast majority is between the independents and the, and the traditional chains for the numbers of opportunity of, pharmacy, of uh, patients to access uh, their, their community pharmacists. Here's a breakdown of uh, across the country of where you see um, traditional change, uh, the, the four categories I was showing you. And I might just draw a little focus right here within Kansas. Uh, as you see the breakdown, we have more independent community pharmacists than we do uh, the other categories. That's generally true throughout all of the Midwest as this is a vast rural area and it may not sustain a larger chain uh, drugstore uh, as well as a independently community owned community pharmacy. We, we look at the population center of the country and the vast majority being mostly on the East Coast. And as you look at those numbers, uh, the proportion of independent community pharmacists is not up to the same level as the chains in many areas, uh, but in some they basically are. As you move West, uh, the population uh, decreases quite a bit until we reach California, uh, which is the most populous state in the United States. And there you see uh, chains and independence uh, pretty much equal. And so um, uh, that kind of gives you the, the layout of community pharmacists and our memberships uh, 
span not only the United States, but also into some US territories as well. So we did a, a survey not too long ago asking community pharmacy owners um, exactly what services uh, do you uh, provide within the community? And so we actually broke this out in two aspects. First off is services that's provided to patients, as you see on the, on the left-hand side over here. On the right-hand side, you'll see how community pharmacists are involved within their local pharmacy, within their local communities as well. And the, on that survey, 85% of the respondents said that they are quote, quote, full line pharmacies. And that means um, they, they identify as uh, apothecaries or compounding long-term care services that they provide uh, all the services or most of the services that pharmacy is allowed to uh, offer uh, within their local jurisdictions. And so like 92% uh, provide wound care, 92% uh, provide medication adherence and synchronization, 76% uh, uh, provide for a home or worksite delivery, which has been very traditional over the number of years and not so much with um, our competitors out in the marketplace. Uh, they offer certain products like hemp-based products as well, which is, which is fairly new and is growing. Uh, compliance packaging is, uh, is becoming, in the last five to 10 years, a, another big asset uh, that's uh, a patient offered uh, a program that, uh, that patients enjoy and, and, and allows them to be able to uh, keep within their, their medication adherence as well. An interesting part here, I think, is 80% of them uh, prior to the, the COVID outbreak were giving flu immunizations, which I think is a great number. I did not expect that number to be quite that high, but influenza vaccines has become uh, such an important part of healthcare prevention uh, in the fall uh, in the United States that many community pharmacists have joined uh, that, that call where it has decreased among healthcare practitioners. Part of that may be due to general practitioners themselves in the United States has dwindled in numbers uh, and pharmacy has stepped up to help take care of that, of that role of immunizations. It'll be interesting to see as we emerge out of this pandemic, whether or not this 80% will increase and I can't help but think that it wouldn't. And as you can see, there's a couple other uh, aspects there of, of community pharmacy and how they uh, involve themselves with products and services. One of the other things is, is important, and I think that separates community pharmacy from their uh, other local chain competitors, is their involvement within the community itself. Um, relationships are, is very near and dear uh, to the community pharmacy owners, and rightfully so, because we're taking care of family members, uh, friends, neighbors, colleagues within the community, and so the relationship aspect is already there personally, and it just normally extends out when we come out to healthcare coverage. And as you can see here, 12% uh, uh, of the owners uh, consider themselves lifelong friends with uh, councilmen that have control over local and city government. S nearly 60% are members of Chamber of Commerce, and Chamber of Commerce are the leaders and directors and work very closely with local governments on increasing uh, business opportunities and drawing uh, patients in, in, in people and population to their local communities. Uh, as you'll also see here, the involvement um, means around 60% of the owners have said they have contributed and provided monetary support uh, anywhere between five or even greater than 10 uh, community organizations. And then 50% actually said that they contributed more than $3,000 annually into support of those community pharmacy or those community organizations. And then finally, uh, down here, one aspect I'd like to, to bring forth is that we've asked for pharmacy owners and some of their employees as well to become involved from the decision-making standpoint. And so 6% of our owners said that they are an elected local or state office, which is very important. We've been pushing more for community pharmacists to be involved in the local, state, and even federal election process so that that voice of community pharmacy can be carried to those decision makers. And uh, we're doing very well. We have a couple of community pharmacies, pharmacy uh, owners that are now within the House of Representatives 
in Washington, D.C. And that has proved to be very valuable to have community pharmacies voice there when questions arise. This next screen here, what I'd like to do is, is talk to you about um, the uh, emerging models and also patient care services and wellness services uh, that community pharmacy owners are providing. And so this emerging model uh, part here at the very top is we, as you can see, collective or sorry, collaborative practice agreements has become uh, very important uh, as we've moved along. So collaborative practice agreements are those that where we work with local physicians in providing the opportunity to sit down and talk to patients on medication therapy management, uh, vaccinations, and so forth. And uh, as you can see in a very short time frame, uh, that collaborative practice agreement has increased. And again, I think post pandemic, we will see that this percentage will, will gain uh, even more uh, uh, further um, usage within the community. Uh, access to electronic medical records is, is very interesting because that goes hand in hand with uh, our medication therapy management with patients. You see a decrease here. I'm not really sure if, if this is really actually the case, either our 24% uh, our or our 15% may be off because I, I know that community pharmacists uh, have been saying that they're gaining more access to the electronic medical records as uh, healthcare pro professionals across the country are moving more out of a traditional paper role to a, an electronic medical record, which allows the more, allows more sharing and allows more data collection and, uh, and data uh, in improvement so that we can utilize that to increase uh, healthcare outcomes. Uh, a residency program is something fairly new. It's been, it's been very popular within the, the healthcare, uh, within uh, the community uh, hospital associations, uh, but not so much within community pharmacy. And we are seeing uh, a growth in that as we speak, and we will see that uh, get better. Transitions of care program. It's, it's the program that we have that uh, where a patient is uh, linked to a community pharmacy, then they get their medications. So when they are dismissed from the hospital, that they do not miss out on uh, their prescription drugs and continue their medication therapy. Many times what we found is that patients will be dismissed, they'll be handed a prescription and they'll fail to get it filled or it'll be a large delay which actually can um, endanger the healthcare outcome and could lead to readmission from that patient uh, back into the hospital, which increases cost to the insurers and to the federal government as taxpayers. And so transition of care has become a, uh, a, a bigger part of uh, these extra services, these emerging models that we're talking about. And, uh, and it's, it's becoming something that community pharmacy has stepped into as they, uh, as they assist those patients in making sure they have their medications before they're dismissed and coming home. Uh, other patient care services, as we see down here, uh, medication therapy management, as I talked about, as you can see, is um, uh, very widely uh, utilized now. That was not the case uh, probably around 15 years ago. The implementation, or the implementation of Medicare Part D uh, and having access to uh, prescription drugs for our seniors um, uh, actually helped kick this along and, uh, and community pharmacists stepped up and started implementing M this MTM program, uh, which allows face-to-face -face meetings uh, with your patients in an appointment-based kind of schedule model. Uh, I know that even though our relationships were great, this has been wonderful for me as I'm sitting down and talking to patients and, and assessing them and working together with their physicians. Compounding, uh, for instance, here has been uh, a large part of community pharmacy through the years. But as you'll see that that percentage has decreased a little bit due to some challenges that's come across through regulations. And also at the same time, some community pharmacists uh, who relied on compounding uh, have now uh, either transitioned out of, uh, out of community pharmacy and have retired. And uh, so we've seen some shrinkage within the market uh, but compounding has probably become more important to those who are involved with it than those who are not. And basically compounding, uh, a definition here in the United States is more or less taking raw materials and putting them together for a doctor's order and coming up with a prescription drug 
that suits their the individual patient's need and that's individualized for their, uh, their particular case. Durable medical equipments, uh, durable medical goods are is like walkers, uh, wheelchairs, canes, uh, also means here in the United States, diabetes testing supplies and so forth. And then ostomy supplies are broken out. They're about in the same group. But as you can see, uh, a, a good chunk of community pharmacies uh, offer these as patient care services. Lastly, uh, what I'd like to look at is the uh, summary of the wellness services. Now wellness services have been around for quite a long time, but within the last 10 years in the United States, they have grown substantially as pharmacists have transitioned out of the traditional uh, dispensing role uh, and have come into more of these other uh, clinical roles, like, like we talked about earlier, immunizations, um, which are flu and also non-flu, blood pressure monitoring, uh, diabetes training, and as you can see, uh, weight management, lipid monitoring. These are opportunities uh, that many of community pharmacies have created uh, within their practice setting to help their patients' outcomes. And, uh, and that has led us into um, uh, a, a opportunity that we thought as community pharmacy owners, uh, perhaps a workaround uh, to the challenges of being reimbursed for our medications. As I said, the margins has become thinner and um, as pharmacy owners, we look to ways of helping our patient. We thought that perhaps what we could do is maybe offer um, the opportunity for these enhanced services that we just talked about uh, in a group setting to a payer, a larger insurer, showing that the role of community pharmacy uh, can actually help lower their overall healthcare costs and create better outcomes. And so NCPA, along with a healthcare group out of North Carolina, created a, an opportunity in a group called CPESN. CPESN is Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network. And like I mentioned before, uh, these group of services that we offer here, along with other various ones as well, uh, is what is a requirement basically for CPESN members to qualify in this group. And what we do, this, this network that we've created, uh, they, they have a set standard uh, of, of practice uh, opportunities that we, like we list here, some also have uh, home care delivery. Uh, they vary across each network. And we have over 40 networks within the United States, mostly scattered um, with individual stores within a local chapter, uh, which is usually state-based. And what, um, what you'll see here in just a moment, uh, we'll show you how that's scattered throughout the United States. But, but basically what we're trying to do is reimagine the healthcare delivery in America. We still have traditional uh, dispensing, but what we also wanna do is be able to uh, fill this gap that we are seeing with the lack of uh, general practitioners uh, within our local communities, but also give value-based healthcare delivery and savings uh, for payers and also better outcomes uh, for our patients. So here's a snapshot that you'll see. Um, and I know this is a, a little busy, but these is the individual chapters that we see across the country. Uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll point to my local uh, network, which is CPESN uh, of Kansas, that I am the lead network facilitator. Uh, and also as a NCPA board member, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I was one of, the, one of the board members that saw this opportunity and, and launched it a few years ago and, and uh, we've seen great success and it's growing. Um, I, uh, I, I think this is going to be the future of healthcare delivery within the United States and, and maybe perhaps across the globe uh, as, as well because as community pharmacy owners, we have a vested interest in our patients and um, the middleman, the PBMs, uh, that work their way into uh, uh, our practice setting are determining uh, amongst physicians uh, the actual product selection for an individual patient. And then also is telling uh, me as a community pharmacy owner, how much they're going to pay. The issue and problem with that is that PBMs, there's only three that actually 
uh, control over 80% of that uh, of the payment source uh, within um, within the United States. That's a that's a very very big influence within the healthcare market, and they utilize that influence also in Congress as well. And that's who we're battling. NCPA battles with uh, the PBM industry on those reimbursements and also on the selection of uh, of certain medications for patients as they are driving uh, more uh, selection from, from themselves on products uh, for patients uh, versus, the, versus physicians. And so with that struggle, uh, we feel like CPESN is negotiating directly with the, manu with the uh, health insurers and not with the PBMs. It gives us a, a better opportunity uh, to have direct relationships uh, uh, with those, uh, those payers. The opportunities um, that also CPSN did this year is that uh, they stepped up and was a, a huge supplier of educational resources and access uh, to certain products like PPE and also vaccines. Uh, and it's allowed community pharmacy to be one of the leaders of, uh, of these services of testing uh, the individual patients and also giving vaccines. And we're proud uh, to be a part of the uh, statewide uh, access to vaccinations. And we feel like we've done a fairly good job in the United States um, uh, with, I think, community pharmacy leading the way. Uh, we've seen uh, roughly about 37% of the United States uh, population has been fully vaccinated. Uh, it's not bad. It needs to get better and it's going to get better. Uh, and it's going to take community pharmacy and their relationships that they have with patients to convince them to get beyond the hesitancy that we're, we're seeing right now here in the United States. But it also, uh, we were uh, very um, influential in having patients come in and getting that initial 37%. Give you an example here in, uh, in Kansas, uh, we have roughly about 36.5% of our patients are fully vaccinated. And uh, we are proud to say that uh, we were, uh, as Walker Drug here in our county, uh, 21,000 population, uh, we, uh, we were helped, able to achieve um, a closer to uh, uh, 36 to 40% of our patients as well, between six pharmacies that represented those 21,000 individuals. And, uh, and three of those uh, pharmacies, and half of them, uh, were ones that, um, that were uh, part of the CPESN network. And we're glad, we're glad to say that uh, we're leading the way. So as you can see here, uh, this is some of the examples that, uh, that CPESN helped uh, independent community pharmacy owners to address the coronavirus issue. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to kind of uh, come back to uh, what the purpose uh, of community pharmacy and pharmacy in general, really, as we have a triad relationship between the physician and also the patient, an equal uh, partnership within that relationship uh, that makes sure that, that we have, um, that we're there and uh, we're able to, to work with the patient uh, routinely uh, in, in maximizing their healthcare outcome. Um, in the United States here, uh, the average community pharmacy visits with their patients 36 times a year, while their physician is only visited three or four times a year. And because of that, uh, we are a huge influencer uh, within uh, patient outcomes and also able to report back to the physicians opportunities that we think that are out there that may be being missed uh, altogether. And so within this, within this role here, um, we see uh, patients um, as, as being the center of the healthcare delivery and that relationship that we have and, and where community pharmacy falls within. Now, I'd like to take a moment here and uh, step back and look at individual uh, pharmacy practice and the role of, of how pharmacists work within the workplace itself. And what you see on the left-hand column here is uh, the duties of pharmacists within the role of filling the prescription need and also now this new role, this new clinical role as well. And obviously filling prescriptions and offering the expertise and safe use is, has been there and will always continue to be there. Uh, we check for medical interactions uh, and we 
we do some education, patient education. Uh, we also give flu shots. I, I will tell you that uh, pharmacists were the only ones who were given flu shots in the country before COVID. But because of the, of the huge aspect of inoculating uh, you know, over 300 million people, we knew that access to um, immunizations was going to be greater. And so what we did is that we trained some of our certified technicians to help us take on that role as well. And I can tell you within my pharmacy practice, uh, that's been huge. Uh, instead of having just one or two pharmacists uh, immunizing, we now have uh, two or three pharmacists and also three technicians that are qualified to do that as well. And of course, uh, overseeing uh, pharmacy technicians and interns and, and just having a, a role within the, uh, uh, the practice setting altogether. And so pharmacy technicians, and uh, we have a couple of different levels of pharmacy technicians and interns. We have certified pharmacy technicians who have a greater role and opportunity, like I said before, giving immunizations, actually entering in data. Uh, some, some states are allowing them to do a final check uh, of the prescription before it goes out uh, as pharmacists are getting out of what we call the bench role for you're behind the computer, behind the bench, checking medications. Um, as this clinical role evolves, uh, we're doing more of uh, around, coming around the bench and speaking more to uh, the patients and spending more time. And in order to allow the dispensing role to not be, um, and the workflow itself not to be uh, disrupted, uh, technicians are taking on that, a greater role. And so, as you can see, traditional, traditionally, they help prepare medications and, and uh, some of those non-certified are also help, helping take care of controlled inventory and actually uh, uh, answering phone calls uh, and uh, kind of playing a, a, a gate monitor for uh, prescriptions as they come through and, and able to, uh, to push the, uh, the need at the moment of that patient or the order to the right individual. And so, uh, hey Brian, yeah. <laughs> sorry, hey. my my, my it, throat caught. We have some really great questions in oh, the chat, okay. so I wanted to give you a heads up. Um, probably whenever you transition to the next slide, we can take a moment and address some of these questions. Great, great, I, and that's Carly uh, Trailer with NCPA, and Carly, uh, she's with me. I appreciate that very much, and we will we will uh, we will do that. So, um, uh, a role of, of community pharmacy. How how do we um, how does a pharmacist become a uh, uh, become a pharmacist? And and uh, what I want to do this slide is very important. It's great. I want to give kudos out to the University of Hawaii at, at Hilo. And um, you'll see that uh, it starts with intermediate and middle school, goes to high school. As individuals are looking to uh, become healthcare professionals, they can see an opportunity of attending a, a college, either in a pre pharmacy program or getting a full four year degree. Uh, then they apply to the College of Pharmacy, which is a four-year program. After that, they uh, take a national exam, which is, allows them to obtain a state license and then also a local state uh, law exam. And after they pass that, they have all these different career options and opportunities out there. And there are many, many of those. So, um, so um, uh, just to show you that we have about right, right around 60,000 uh, uh, students enrolled uh, in 140 different schools across the country. And so community pharmacy is still uh, uh, very well um, sought after as a profession. Last point I'd like to just bring out, and because I, I want to save time for questions, in that in our battle with that we had with the PBMs, uh, the pharmacy benefit managers, the biggest challenge that we had is that uh, many times they hid behind a, a, an obscure law that said that they, uh, they could not be um, regulated at the state level uh, because of, of a protection of a particular law. This has been going on for a number of years. And uh, 2015, we, there was a ruling in Arkansas that said that state, so state uh, legislatures had control over how they could regulate uh, the PBMs within their individual states. Um, it was appealed, uh, community pharmacy lost that appeal. And then later on, the opportunity for it to, this case to be brought before the Supreme Court of the United States uh, came about. And um, we had a ruling in December uh, that said uh, states do have that right. And what was interesting to us is that it was a unanimous uh, decision, uh, which is a huge victory for community pharmacy, as we see now more local control over those uh, in insurers and having uh, 
uh, more of an influence on them and, and having them uh, fit the regulations and having them also adhere to more uh, uh, clinical standards and uh, opportunities for patients and for healthcare practitioners to practice within um, their, their communities and serve their patients. And so with that, I, I wanted to say thank you. And uh, thank you, Carly, for reminding me on this time. Sometimes I get a little windy, Dr. Joshi, and I, I apologize. I, I'm, I'm very proud to be a community pharmacy owner and a practitioner, and I can never see me doing anything else. So um, let's go into questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So our first question that we got was about, can you elaborate a little bit more about the opportunities for pharmacies to provide compliance packaging to patients? And then we had a, a question a little bit later that's related and said, how has COVID impacted overall medication compliance? So you've got, explain about compliance packaging, but then also kind of shed light on how COVID has impacted medication compliance overall. Yes. So um, it, interestingly enough, about a year ago, when the pandemic really started in, uh, in the United States, and it was around uh, March of 2020, um, one of the things that, uh, that we saw was uh, uh, patients not wanting to come out uh, into community pharmacies uh, and exposing themselves to uh, other individuals. And so we saw a, an increase from a normal 30-day supply to 90-day supplies. Along with that, um, uh, patients were, uh, you know, wanting to keep track of, of this larger number of, of uh, prescriptions and, and, and the, the daily routine. And so when you have 10, 12 different um, medications, it's hard to keep track of. And so uh, many of them are seeking uh, individualized packages or maybe cards that held their medications that allow them to keep track of taking their medications properly uh, every day. And so uh, we saw an increase on that uh, as patients were seeking that. But at the same time, uh, we saw healthcare, we saw family members who had elderly uh, uh, family members at home uh, who were trying to take care of their medications uh, see this compliance packaging um, as, as being an important aspect in delivering their medications as well. And so uh, community pharmacies uh, have stepped up. It's been a growing. Uh, opportunity in the first place, uh, but I did. We did see a, an increase uh, with the uh, with the coronavirus uh, response here in the United States. And what was the second part there, Carly? Again, so it was it was talking about how COVID has impacted medication compliance, and just anecdotally, like med. MedSync and med compliance is a big passion of mine. And we saw a lot of our members doing basically like rebranding their medication synchronization programs to COVID protection programs. So helping patients not have to come to the pharmacy so often in the month. So we, we saw independent pharmacists really stepping up and helping address um, medication compliance. So she was just asking for your, your perspective of how COVID has, in general has impacted medication compliance. And, and one more aspect on that, if you don't mind, is that the, the delivery system as well uh, changed dramatically. We saw, we have a, a drive-through for patients to be able to, to not have to come into the store and they could drive to our drive-through window and pick up their medications. It was a, a fairly big aspect of our, uh, our, our delivery system. However, we saw a tremendous increase uh, uh, from patients. And at the same time, our home delivery uh, more than doubled as well. And so. Uh, we had one delivery car uh, that uh, we utilized. We ended up having to go to uh, two as we expanded our home delivery. So, uh, so we actually shut our lobby down uh, a couple of times uh, throughout the last year in order to uh, help mitigate um, uh, the aspect of being exposed to individual members. So anyway, thank you for that question. It's a great question. So the next question, we actually got a, a couple of times. So they want you to kind of shed some light into electronic prescribing and what pharmacies do to ensure, um, you know, that patients, that, they're, that those e-prescriptions are error-free and that you're preventing fraud. So if someone were to have sent a prescription illegally or outside of the traditional way. Yeah, that, and that's, that's a great question. Electronic prescribing, um, has been around for well over a decade um, and um, it became more man sort of mandated. It's not really, uh, it's an absolute, but there was a push and there was an, an, a, uh, a financial incentive to physicians to uh, switch over to uh, electronic prescribing uh, 
uh, again, in order to be able to fall within that electronic medical record and uh, having access to uh, that particular data. And, and so the federal government uh, spent uh, an enormous amount of time and, uh, and finances and resources into making sure that it is, um, uh, it is it's safe and that it's uh, free of any fraud or any kind of manipulation. And uh, we do have a couple of uh, uh, companies within the, the United States, and one in particular that's, that's probably the, the, the majority uh, user, uh, allowing that uh, transition of that electronic data from a physician uh, to a pharmacy, and it's directed uh, by this organization. Uh, they are um, very highly uh, secure, and uh, they've, again, they've in invested um, a many number of uh, dollars. So, so the, I think overall, we feel like it is very well uh, secure and free of fraud. And it's, it's shown to be that the case um, over, maybe over a decade now. So. Awesome. So one um, audience member pointed out that with the emerging models enhanced services pharmacies, the collaborative practice agreements have actually shown phenomenal growth from 33 to, 30, to 43 in just two years. Um, can, so can you can shed some light on some specific reasons for that growth? Yes, um, for, for, for right off the bat, I will tell you that as patients uh, hunkered down, uh, they did not actually go see the physician uh, as often. And so initially what we saw was uh, patients missing appointments or being trying to be rescheduled uh, eventually, that led to some more electronic type means. Uh, well, we had virtual meetings uh, between patients and physicians. And so, um, so what we saw was that since patients weren't going in directly to maybe pick up a handwritten prescription, uh, physicians turned more towards the electronic healthcare record. And they have access to that uh, within their own electronic healthcare record exists an electronic prescribing uh, methodology, and uh, and what and it keeps better record keeping for for all of us, for both pharmacists and the physicians, and and um, and so I think that was the biggest driver of all during the coronavirus, uh, and also again the uh, there's been a push from the federal government and also insurers to uh, uh, increase the use of that electronic prescribing. Awesome. So then our next question that we had was on how do you cope with mail order pharmacies? So that like that drive to online pharmacies. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And that's been a growing market and a competitor to us because many of the mail order pharmacies are owned by the insurers, uh, the PBMs themselves, which uh, creates a challenge uh, for community pharmacy in the fact that we are sending all of our data and we are to our competitor, and we're being paid for by our competitor, uh, which is, is, as you can imagine, not very fair and allows to have the eyes uh, of those of our competitors to within our businesses. And, and so uh, self-fulfilling, we've seen um, the insurers push more individuals into a, their own mail order uh, product. And how we, we compete with that is that we, patients have choice. Um, and we can usually compete with them many times uh, from a financial standpoint, but also just from a, a ease of use. Because uh, give you an example, many uh, patients are uh, required to have two weeks of uh, ordering before uh, they are able to receive their products. So there's a big gap. Uh, sometimes orders change uh, on, a, uh, on a per appointment basis. And uh, then you, therefore you're out another several weeks before you get the right medications in. So Convenience to patients, uh, I, I think helps, allows us to, to compete with that. And also uh, a lack of relationship, as I told you how important the relationship was between a community pharmacy uh, owner and, and pharmacist and the patient doesn't exist within the uh, mail order aspect. And so people value that. And when they're given a choice, they overwhelmingly choose their community pharmacy. Thank you, Brian. Um, so the next question that they have um, is, do pharmacies ever pay physicians to prescribe particular brands? So maybe you can expound on some of the, like the kickback laws that we have in the United States. 
Yes, that, there are some laws that do not allow uh, uh, physicians to be influenced um, to prescribe a certain medication for, um, for a monetary uh, kickback, more or less. Uh, also, physicians aren't allowed uh, basically to own uh, services that also um, uh, allow revenue to flow back to them. So uh, it's highly discouraged that, that uh, physicians own any pharmacies, but for instance, they can't, they can't uh, own a durable medical equipment facility uh, because of the conflict of interest. And so, so there are some good laws out there that do not allow um, physicians to be influenced in that and really more or less making the right uh, product selection for the patient based upon their need and not so much for their own personal uh, gain. So this is a more recent question, but it's connected to what you had just answered. Do small manufacturers pay, per, pay prescribers to write for their brand? So maybe share a little bit about kind of the, the drug company industry and through their outreach to local physicians, what that looks like. Yeah, and so um, again, uh, their, um, the kickback laws that are in place uh, do not allow payments. Uh, but there, there, were, there was at one time, not that long ago, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, uh, uh, physicians weren't allowed to be paid, but they could be influenced by, you could take them on trips, you could buy them dinner, uh, you could do all these other things to work around that, uh, that monetary reward. Uh, and that too has been uh, reined in quite a bit uh, actually to the point where not that long ago, uh, manufacturers weren't even allowed to have uh, their own ink pens uh, with, their, uh, with their company name to be given to physicians. So, so there's been a really big crackdown on influencing that, that decision-making process so that, again, it's more patient-focused rather than uh, personally gained. So yeah, great questions because I forget We've been dealing with that for so long, I forget that in other countries that may not be the same. So appreciate that. Thanks, Brian. The next session they have is to elaborate more on the community practice residency programs. So yes, um, so the residency programs uh, come in uh, one and two year programs for most of the uh, community pharmacy based residency programs in the United States. And basically upon uh, uh, graduating and obtaining uh, your license, uh, to practice, uh, there are resident, there are community residencies, and like I said, most of these uh, really fall within uh, the health system or hospital uh, settings more so than uh, community pharmacies. But you're allowed to come into uh, a residency community uh, program and um, and practice as a as a pharmacist. Most of these are really kind of concentrated uh, on certain niches within community pharmacy. It might be diabetes care, it might be uh, elderly care. It could be vaccinations and so forth, but uh, many of them are focused usually on a certain niche when a particular uh, resident uh, wants to uh, focus on a, a certain aspect within pharmacy and get that training and then go into the community pharmacy um, uh, environment and marketplace. Uh, and they are, they are looked upon as a higher asset because of that extra amount of uh, experience within the marketplace. Thanks, Brian. Okay. So the next question goes back to that um, table that you showed where over the course of several years, independent pharmacies versus chain pharmacies versus mass merchants. So um, are we seeing that independents are losing ground to change to chain pharmacies? And what are some things that NCPA is doing to encourage an independent pharmacy ownership? Great, great, great question. And so um, I may take the latter and then kind of back up a little bit. Uh, NCPA uh, values its members and the services that they provide to their communities. And so what we do, we give them uh, business um, acumen and we also allow them to have increased clinical access to resources that helps improve uh, their pharmacy practice and in turn helps out for, uh, patient outcomes. And uh, so as a resource, NCPA is uh, by far and away probably the, uh, the best national organization for its members. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are a, an advocate, a voice uh, within the state legislatures and also at the federal level, and especially at the federal level. Uh, there is an old saying with NCPA is, is that you get into politics or get out of pharmacy. And the reason being is because uh, regulations and, and, uh, and the laws 
are highly influential upon the pharmacy practice itself. So uh, you probably heard this saying, you need to be at the table. If you're not at the table, uh, you're on the menu. And we've seen that uh, become the case. So NCPA has dedicated itself to making sure that community pharmacy is, has those resources available to allow them to practice and, and survive as a, as a business. Yes, we have seen uh, a consolidation within uh, community pharmacy over the past uh, decade. Uh, we've seen a shrinkage uh, of around uh, you know, four to 6%. And part of that's because uh, community pharmacies have been, have been owned by elderly, or not elderly, I should say, but older owners. And, um, and as the margins have shrunk, the opportunities for them to uh, sell their businesses off to another, uh, another independent owner has become a, a little more challenging because of the, uh, of the profitability, lack of profitability, uh, that may be as an opportunity for an ownership. For those of us who are kind of the older generation who've been around for quite some time, uh, we, we've been through these ebbs and flows before and we know that uh, community pharmacy will survive. And uh, we just have a, a little bit of a, uh, of a lull right now, but I, I see a bright light ahead of us as clinical opportunities become more important and the role of community pharmacy increases. So uh, shrinkage in the market, but I, I also think that there'll be some growth opportunities as we move forward. Thanks, Brian. So can you explain a little bit more about um, how online refills work and home delivery within independent pharmacies? Yeah, um, so uh, I will tell you from, I'll just anecdotally tell you my story is that uh, we created a number of years ago uh, an app uh, on, uh, for smartphones, and we also have a website. We give patients an opportunity to uh, reach out to us to get resources for themselves on individual medications and also uh, refills and trying to make it as easy as possible. Medication synchronization is, has helped along that line as well. And we also have text-based communication with our patients. So we give patients every opportunity to be able to uh, either call in, text, or be able to refill uh, their medications uh, online uh, or through their app. And so it's been a, a big asset to us as we're able to streamline our workflow system and uh, it's made us more efficient here. I think there was another aspect I missed on that, Carly. Was the last part? Electronic no, refill? No, I think you got it. Okay, All right, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this next question is, how do you handle expired drugs? Ah. So um, uh, we, we have a, a company that actually uh, comes in and um, we go through our shelves and pull products that's about to expire. Uh, sometimes we miss a few and some got to the expiration date where we're able to catch those and we collate those and we have a, a, an individual that comes in, collects them and uh, they will return those products to the manufacturers and hopefully we get a, a, a better reimbursement uh, on those products than we have. But over the number of years, that, that amount has decreased uh, to the point of where we, we don't get anything uh, back to those. So inventory management has become very, very important for us here in the United States. And at the same time, I, I, will, I will tell you, as I've talked to some of my, my older colleagues, is that we've seen expiration dates actually get smaller over the years. Uh, I remember when I got out of school, it wouldn't be unusual to see a, a product last four or five years on an expiration on the shelf. Now, if we see two years, uh, we're lucky. And so that is a challenge on inventory management, which has a direct impact to the bottom line. Thanks, Brian. Um, so let's see, this next question, um, let's kind of expand a little bit on those online refills. How are you handling refills of controlled medications? So like narcotics and sedatives during COVID? Um, that hasn't changed really much during COVID, uh, other than the fact that uh, patients may not be seeing physicians as often. Uh, in the past, what would happen, it would almost be mandated, depending on the practitioner themselves, whether or not a controlled substance is required a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, visit. And uh, that has changed a little bit. Uh, so physicians are able to put refills on some controlled medications. Uh, there are some that they're not allowed to put uh, any refills on at all. Uh, but if they have refills and uh, if a patient indicates it's time for a refill for them to, to obtain, uh, they can do so. And it falls right into our pharmacy management system, uh, which we rely on very heavily uh, as a, a manager of that workflow. So it comes into our workflow. We see it. 
Uh, if it requires a, a, a refill, uh, we can electronically send that refill to a patient, to the physician, and, and the physician uh, will respond in time electronically many times as well. Excellent. So I like this next question because you have this, you're the perfect person to answer this, is how do, um, or how have pharmacists evolved to start, you know, providing point of care testing and immunizations when that hasn't been incorporated into um, like the academic curriculum until recent years. So how has pharmacy as an industry grown and coped with those changes? Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll take that in actually two segments or two parts because uh, immunizations have been uh, a part of uh, the uh, academic model here in the United States. I know at least in Kansas for around 30 years now. And, but um, the opportunity uh, to give those vaccinations really didn't come to, I would say, full fruition until uh, the late 90s. So it's, it's been around 20 to 25 years uh, that pharmacists have been doing that. And it's considered a standard care practice now. As I would say more, for instance, influenza vaccines are given by pharmacists now than any other uh, prescriber in the country. Uh, from the point of care testing, uh, that's still a challenge. It's, it's also uh, evolving as we're going along. COVID uh, did give pharmacists the opportunity uh, as access points for testing, uh, as that's become much more important. I see post-pandemic, Point of care testing being the one of the new frontiers and being also a very important aspect of uh, practice, especially within that group of CPESN or those enhanced uh, uh, pharmacists that work within that network. So Brian, describe the role of the community pharmacist in the patient care process and how that differs from inpatient care. So in another way, like how can community pharmacists impact outpatient care? That's a, that's a great stamp, great question. And I'm gonna go right back to relationships. Um, and also I may even evolve into like uh, the vaccination process as a great example of how uh, uh, relationships have an impact on patient care. I, I, have, I have many, many patients who are hesitant about getting the vaccine. They've come in, they've actually created an appointment to meet with me and sit down personally and ask me how I felt about the vaccine and to answer their questions and their fears. And so I think that has a direct impact uh, upon their decision-making process, which I think in turn has them make good choices, which I think impacts their healthcare, which I think in turn actually helps create savings uh, to uh, payers. So it's a win-win, win-win <laughs> uh, altogether. And, uh, and we're very, very proud to be a part of that and utilizing that relationship uh, opportunity with our patients. Thanks, Brian. Um, so the next question we have is how do you handle transfers? And I'm gonna add a little bit to that. How do you incorporate pharmacy students into transfer workflow? Yeah, actually, uh, yes, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Most of the time, we, we have basically two avenues of transfers uh, between a patients uh, obtaining medications at one pharmacy uh, over to another. And most of the time it's phone call driven, uh, and at least an initiation. And we can give the information uh, over the phone uh, by voice. Uh, also, uh, they can request uh, electronic uh, transfer of those. Normally that doesn't happen within that same electronic platform that we have with the physicians. It's usually fax based. Uh, and especially if you got large amount uh, of prescriptions that you need to transfer, usually that uh, helps speed up that process. And so, uh, so, and as we become more of a transient society, it seems like people going here and there, we see people um, doing many transfers to and then back again. So it creates a little bit of a challenge in the workflow of the day, but it's not too bad. Thanks, Brian. So the next question is about over-the-counter medications. So how are OTC meds regulated in the community pharmacy setting? Um, so speak a little bit towards that. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's not as much regulation as you can imagine on over-the-counter or, or OTC medications. Uh, and pharmacies um, vary quite a bit in their providing of those, uh, those products. We have some that have, we call, we call that area a front end here in the United States because the back end is really the pharmacy counter where we do most of the prescription filling. 
And so on that front end, we have some that have no front end at all. Absolutely, it's an apothecary style uh, pharmacy, no front end whatsoever. They might have a few OTC products behind the counter that they might recommend and, and then sell. And then there are some pharmacies that that's it. They have a huge front end and uh, not much of a, uh, of a back end. So we have that, that wide varying uh, gambit of pharmacy practice, but basically uh, most pharmacies have somewhat of a front end and uh, they utilize that as a part of their consulting with patients and uh, as whether or not a patient presents themselves with a condition. And uh, from an assessment standpoint, I as a pharmacist think that if they need to go see a physician, we refer them to their local physician or to a hospital setting. Uh, and at the same time, if we can actually help them treat that, that, uh, that issue that they have with over-the-counter medications, uh, we show them that product and again, based upon that trust and faith that they have within us, they take those up quite often. So here in our store, uh, we have a, a, quite a wide variety. Uh, I'll give you an example. One third, we have about 3000 square feet in the pharmacy here in Baxter Springs. One third of that is um, attributed to over-the-counter medications. And, and we're proud to be able to offer that uh, a wide variety for our small community here in, in Baxter Springs. Thanks, Brian. So next we wanna talk about what are the kind of the differences in the um, patent progress or process for brands versus generic medications? So uh, in the United States, um, it, it varies and it's been varying a lot more during the COVID because um, uh, we're looking at opportunities of bringing products that can help treat uh, patients' needs more quickly to uh, the marketplace. And uh, each individual administration may have an influence on that. It's become somewhat of a campaign uh, slogan on, on trying to lower prescription drug prices and having access to those products. But uh, most of the time, uh, it's a, uh, a new drug application when submitted. It takes about 17 years uh, within the, the, um, the chain uh, of uh, development to actual delivery to patients. And many of those years are eaten up within clinical trials. Um, the United States is, is probably has a, a, a right reputation uh, of being um, very um, focused on those clinical trials and it, and it holds up those products coming to the market probably more so than what the manufacturers really want to. Um, but the FDA, the F Food and Drug Administration has control over that. And, uh, and they're proud of their, their track record uh, as- And, uh, and that, uh, that track record has allowed them to have a safety uh, record that's, that's, that's pretty good. So, uh, so anyway, yes, there, 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 there is that, um, that patent protection and they can actually ask for an extension on that. Um, sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't, uh, but, uh, the generic process and, and getting patent products to, to generic access uh, is very, very important when we come to uh, uh, control of uh, medication prices because there's a huge difference there usually. All right, Brian, I think we have time for one more question. So I, okay. um, so Dr. Joshi, let me know if we can go over a little bit with time. Um, but this next question is about opioid regulations. So has COVID impacted um, regulations for opioid prescriptions during lockdown. So just in the last year, have we seen any regulation changes? Yeah, um, you know, um, if I could, the precedent up to that, in the, again, in the last 10 years, there's been a major push on uh, controlling opioid dispensing, uh, because I'm sure you've read and you've heard about the opioid crisis that we've had in the United States. And it's become a legislative uh, issue as well as it should be, and also a, a healthcare issue as many community pharmacists are the gatekeepers for those products. Um, uh, the onus on uh, community pharmacy owners uh, has, has been increasing uh, quite a bit. What we saw was, I, I think, uh, about 10 years ago, a hard push. It kind of leveled out just a little bit. Uh, during the COVID uh, crisis, we, we didn't see, I don't think, uh, a, a higher push. Uh, however, um, we're, we're seeing maybe somewhat of an emergence of maybe a little bit of an uptick in certain areas as, as maybe uh, the focus hasn't been on uh, opioid, um, proper opioid dispensing. And we kind of took our foot off the pedal a little bit. Uh, I'm sure that's gonna be coming back. Regulations are still there. Uh, I think there'll just be a greater focus on it. 
but the opioid crisis has is, is a big political aspect uh, here in the United States, and uh, I see we'll see more of a focus post pandemic on this. Yeah. So, uh, So, Hello. Dr. Joshi, we have a couple of questions left, but we can respond to those offline yeah, yeah, if we please. need to be conscious of time. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um, this next question that we have is actually about um, Indian pharmacists seeking to move to the United States. So, saying, how could an Indian pharmacist pharmacy grad get a job in the United States? What are the steps slash how hard would it be? That's a great question. I'm not sure if I'm going to be highly qualified to answer that as well, but it's, uh, it's my understanding, and this is Brian Caswell's uh, understanding, of course, is the fact that um, uh, I, I believe that uh, there is a reciprocal process uh, on training in India uh, that's, that's approved by the um, individual states uh, here on recognition of the formal training. And uh, if it's recognized, I think you can apply uh, for a license just like any other uh, uh, US-based uh, pharmacist. Um, and, uh, and if not, I think there's been some, some workarounds on that, um, uh, maybe some uh, equivalency type tests or whatever that, that case may be. Uh, that part I'm not 100% sure of, but I do have uh, some friends and colleagues uh, that have made that transition and, uh, and are happily practicing uh, in rural and in also urban areas. Um, uh, one of the one of my most as being president, and I sorry, but Dr. Joshi, if I'm going to get off here just for just for a second, one of the best aspects of being president is meeting pharmacists from all across the country, and uh, some of the most uh, uh, rewarding relationships that I built have been with some pharmacists in New York City, where. Uh, independent community pharmacy, even in, in the most densely populated uh, city in the United States and in the world, uh, community pharmacy is thriving. And, uh, and some of those owners uh, came from India. And uh, they have been an absolute joy to get to know because their, their pharmacy practice within New York City is completely different. Um, and in some cases, not so much, but completely different than it is here in rural America. So sharing those best practices has been uh, a valuable asset personally to me as well. So Brian, I'll add a little bit to that just to emphasize that our licensures are tied to our states and not a national licensure. So if you work for say like um, the veteran affairs, like there are certain aspects where like you can have one license and work in multiple states, for me, I'm licensed in the state of Georgia and the state of North Carolina, but I live in Virginia. So I don't practice pharmacy in Virginia. So you, it's very state-based and every state has their different regulations for what constitutes. So as the state of New York may be different than if you were to go to say Wisconsin to try and practice pharmacy there. So it's very state specific, um, but excellent. You, then, yeah, that's yeah. great. The next question is about academic change. So this is another one, Brian, I'm happy to, to help with that answering this. So academic change um, in India requires a lot of effort. How does that differ from the United States? So whenever they're trying to update curriculum to keep pace with you know, pharmacy practice, how does that differ from India? Okay, I, I will have to pass that along because I'm not sure how that works within India, but. I do know as an advisory council uh, member uh, to the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy is that staying ahead of that, uh, that pace uh, has, has been a challenge, but it's also very rewarding. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, CPESN, as it grew, uh, has now incorporated itself uh, into the academic workplace. And so now it's, a, it's an integral part and, and the students actually love it because they feel like that they actually get to practice what they're actually taught. So, uh, so I don't know if you can uh, put more into that, Carly, as, as from a, uh, the, the differentiation between the two countries. So I would say that um, we were, so we're a national association, NCPA. There's a national association for colleges of pharmacy. So AACP, American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. And so they advocate for regular curricular updates. Um, so a lot of the faculty members that I interact with across the country 
country every like I think it's four to six years they have to do like a curriculum overhaul so it's kind of built into their standards when it comes to their school accreditation is that they must update their curriculum now I will also comment that the colleges of pharmacy in the United States could do a lot more to advance community practice education because community practices is, is advancing at like light speed right now. Um, and so um, we do have organizations like ACT. So this works with in tandem with the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network that Brian was sharing earlier. So it's faculty members who are advocating for um, progressive education with community pharmacy. So we have, I think 80 plus schools and we, all, we have about 130, 140 colleges of pharmacy in the United States. So 80 plus schools are advocating like very strongly for those changes to happen. So I would say it's not perfect, but there are some fail safes in place to make sure that the curriculum matches practice, right? So we wanna make sure that our students are at the cutting edge of um, pharmacy practice for sure. Um, all right, so let's see, we're just at the bottom. Okay, so I like this question. Um, how can pharmacists provide or what services can pharmacists provide outside of counseling and dispensing? So we've listed a couple. So Brian, just for you to reiterate, what are some of those enhanced patient care services? Yeah, they're, they're, they're wide. And actually uh, those niches are many times uh, created uh, from some community pharmacy uh, owners themselves and just creating creating some of those new niches. But um, uh, the one thing, I, and I hate to keep harping back on uh, CPESN, but uh, CPESN ESN has been a great uh, advocate uh, for community pharmacy and, and those services that's delivered. But uh, for instance, uh, we never really took a blood pressure check many times before. Well, now we have a, a practice setting that's actually set along that line. So from a cardiovascular standpoint, uh, a diabetes standpoint, uh, we're doing more blood pressure checks. We're doing A1C checks, uh, and we're keeping those records and helping monitor uh, patients as they progress uh, through their disease state. And uh, and it's interesting. I think there's been a another aspect of this because patients before didn't care much about. I mean, I shouldn't say they didn't care, but they probably weren't as uh, focused on their disease state until they went to see their physician. Well, now that they see their pharmacist more often are asked that question and they're engaged within their disease state more often, which I think brings more awareness to themselves and, um, and I hope it creates a, a better outcome as well. Absolutely. So um, Brian, this question is more specific to what Indian pharmacists are, are seeing today. Um, so since mucormycosis, so I apologize for my pronunciation, is highly drug resistant, does community pharmacists slash pharmacy have any role in improving the clinical outcomes of this emerging pathogen, especially in COVID-19 recovered patients? This is a situation that's escalating day by day in India. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not super up to date with that particular pathogen. So um, what in your practice have you seen with that particular pathogen emerging in COVID recovered patients? Yeah, that, that's a good, great question because we've not seen that, at least as far as I know here in the United States. Um, but if presented with uh, a case like that, uh, identification of individual patients and making sure that they're being uh, cared for properly and that many times it's not uh, allowed just to continue on, um, I think is a role of community pharmacy because we are uh, the healthcare resource and the voice of, um, of healthcare in many, many communities. And, Give you an example, like in Kansas, we are a very rural state. We have a little over 2 million people within the state. Uh, probably uh, half that population might be scattered between uh, the five or six larger cities. And then we have a very large um, rural community that's agriculturally based and so forth. So um, if we see uh, issues like this emerge, uh, it's gonna be the role of community pharmacists to identify that and to get that patient to the proper healthcare provider so that we don't have a further spread of, um, of challenges like this. And I think we're gonna see this also with the variants, even though community pharmacy may not be able to do a, a sequencing of the virus, that they can get them to the right lab so that uh, the state officials can identify those uh, emerging variants uh, within communities and hopefully uh, suppress the, uh, the acceleration of, of pathogens like, like you just mentioned, or uh, perhaps other variants as, as we go along as a prevention. 
All right, Brian, this is our last question. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so what we're seeing in, um, in India, in these high population areas, what are some things that pharmacists can do to help support um, patients in those highly populated areas during COVID? Um, so kind of leaning on some of your experiences with your colleagues, say in New York City, what are some things that they were able to do and services they were able to provide um, during this lockdown period to keep you know, the quality of patient care where it should be? Yeah, yeah, it, it, a great, great question as well. And I will tell you, those colleagues that I visited um, in New York City, I think, uh, at least here in the, the national media uh, within the United States, and I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming across the world, you know, New York City uh, took on the role of being uh, ground zero uh, for uh, the pandemic about a year ago. And so visiting with my colleagues on how they were uh, uh, more or less addressing the needs, uh, as, as access to healthcare providers decreased, as we went into lockdown and people stayed home, uh, having access to patients was very important. And uh, we did see some uh, acceleration into questions and to uh, uh, some resources that patients were, were looking for, they always had access to from their community pharmacy. Uh, they, they accessed us through social media, for instance, and we saw our social media use just absolutely explode. And so uh, uh, really, I kind of consider us the wellness um, well of the community. And so people come to us for information and for questions, sometimes not pharmacy related, I will tell you at that. And uh, there, some of them are kind of kind of challenging, uh, but uh, being that resource, they rely on us heavily for, for many, many questions. And so creating an avenue of access uh, for them has um, created some new opportunities for us. Like I said, in, in social media, and of course the phone is always available as well, but we, we saw quite a bit of uh, communication along those uh, different varying te telecommunication devices increase quite a bit because we were locked down, we didn't allow patients to come in and they still needed access to healthcare. All right. Well, Dr. Joshi, I'll go ahead and pass the mic back to you. That was all of our questions. Uh, thank you so much, Carly, for making it uh, very interactive and uh, really those very excellent session. And I really appreciate, you know, the patience and knowledge of uh, Brian. And uh, I think we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Gopinath, uh, who is one of the senior most pharmacy officer. Uh, and he's a representative of the Government uh, Pharmacy Officers of Association of India. Uh, Gopinath, sir, one small question. Go ahead, Gopinath, sir. Mr. Gopinath. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Respected President, Mayor's Fellow of the Country, and Associated Member, it's a very happy and uh, great honor to be associated with you. I had a part of this program. I have a couple of questions. Uh, like, uh, pharmacists are very respected, recognized. And help the job in the United States of America. What would be the reason? And the second one is do you have any mechanism to control the entry of pharmacies into the community? So it will be appreciated. Carly, you're on mute. Are you audible? Uh, no, uh, you have to speak a little louder. Uh, Carly, I think you're on mute. <laughs> uh, Still there. Uh, Mr. Gopinath, only one question because we have, uh, uh, you know, the scarcity of time. Uh, please speak louder. Dr. Yossi, I, I missed the question. Uh, I don't know if you could. I am asking him to repeat it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even I could not hear well. Okay. Um, as great as this telecommunication world we have and Zoom uh, calls, and everything, yeah. we still have challenges to meet. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, are you able to ask the question, Mr. Gopinath? Okay, Pavitra, I, we can come back to him later. Uh, yes, can sir. you kindly proceed with uh, you know the uh, next, next aspect? Uh, 
Yes, yes, sir. Firstly, I would like to uh, start by thanking Mr. Caswell and uh, Carly Taylor for wonderfully carrying out the Q&A session. It was wonderful. Um, thank you so much. So now may I request Professor N. Udupa, Executive Director, ACPI, uh, to felicitate our speaker. Yeah, it was uh, very nice, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Castle, moderated by Dr. Carly Taylor. It was a very great session, and uh, it is one of the international first uh, event uh, we have conducted. So it was uh, very nicely presented from A to Z, from uh, community, clinical, and uh, with, uh, with the various drug interaction and the uh, over-the-counter prescription handling, opioid handling, and so many aspects are very nicely explained. And he has not left every question and every this is a very nice answers and clarifications are given. And today, great learning was there. And we Indians have particularly the community clinical pharmacy side, we have learned a lot of things and it will also help us to take forward some of the very good things which are happening in under and with the great experience he has authoritatively has given this lecture. So I have great pleasure in uh, felicitating him and giving this certificate by our uh, to Brian Casal, president of NCPA USA. On behalf of uh, our uh, ACPI, our Indian uh, South India chapter, I uh, wholeheartedly appreciate this event and uh, uh, Dr. Nagapanayak, Dr. Joshi, and all the people who have attended this. We appreciate uh, this particular uh, uh, interaction. And uh, once again, our great appreciation and felicitation to. Uh, so we present this uh, certificate uh, to Dr. Brian uh, Castell from. Uh, our ACPI India chapter. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to extend out an invitation as well. If there are any further questions today or in the future, please reach out to NCPA. We're here. Uh, we're a part of a, a global community of healthcare pra practitioners, and, and we, we embrace all pharmacists across the world in sharing best practices and, uh, and just meeting the challenges for our patients. So thank you for the opportunity today to all of you. Uh, and I look forward to um, being in further communication if you'd like. Uh, but I wish you all the best, especially during these challenging times. And uh, please use us as a resource if you would like. Yeah, Pavitra. Uh, thank you, Mr. Caswell. Uh, now I request. Just pardon me one second. There's a glitch. So now I request um, Professor Anantanayak Nagappa, National President ACPI, for the presidential address. The things how begin in a very uh, big manner by calling Dr. Brian Caswell for your uh, uh, inaugural uh, international uh, lectures. Dr. Anwan Joshi and his team should become, uh, be congratulated for conducting an excellent session. And um, it was a great learning experience for all of us. Although I have tried my uh, exploring the knowledge about U.S. pharmacy. Today, so many things were clarified. And uh, I think uh, uh, we have to take the moment further by adopting some of the practices which uh, was described by Dr. Brain Castle in his lecture. The services are more important rather than the product. So we should move to the patient-centric leave about the product. Products are manufactured in a wonderful manner, which is accepted by all over the world, even in USA. But how do we use it? It's a big challenge for all of us in India. And we are having a lot of problems in using because there are so many conventional things which are coming in the way to, learn, to adopt new uh, things in the society. 
I, my, many of my students work in New York and other places also, Florida also. So they are also uh, interacting with them. I have learned that uh, uh, they also have to struggle a lot to come to this stage and uh, uh, attain a status of uh, uh, what community pharmacy enjoys today in US. So like that only we have to struggle. So the academics and as well as the practicing pharmacists, both are in a, in a, in a big uh, mood after this lecture to take the momentum further. Thank you very much. Uh, Anand Joshi, please uh, uh, continue this type of uh, uh, educative programs in the future. And also, uh, apart from it, we have to start some training programs which can be more uh, effective in implementing what Brain Caswell has discussed in his lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Clary Taylor, for a nice uh, interactive session. Sorry. Thank you so much, sir. So may I now request Dr. K.S.G. Arul Kumaran, Secretary, ACPI, South President, ACPI Kerala, to for the word of thanks. Thank you, Pavitra. The best and beautiful things in the world cannot be touched or even seen. They must be felt by heart. Thank you is one of such prayer among them. I consider it a great privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries who have witnessed it as a memorable and successful webinar. Today, my words are not enough to express the gratitude on behalf of Association of Community Pharmacists of India and KTN College of Pharmacy, Kerala. I would like to thank Mr. Brian, President NCPA USA, who graced us with his thought-provoking session and revealed some interesting facts. The point where the speaker told us about the role of clinical pharmacists in uh, immunization was really informative. I'm pretty sure the quantum of knowledge that the speaker gave us will definitely help our faculty students to understand what is the role of clinical pharmacists in USA. And this is for your kind information is that Mr. Brian is, the lead, is a leader in his community and donates 10 gallons of compounded hand sanitizers, not the ready-made one, compounded hand sanitizers to the people over his place. Really, I thank him. And the way he answered the, all the questions, all the questions which were raised by the uh, delegates, patiently, it was very awesome. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Uh, the, the, the work you are doing for your community pharmacy people is awesome. Friend in need is a friend indeed. In this connection, I thank my beloved friend, Dr. Josie, for his motivation and his vision towards the pharma education and research. Two days back, he called me, will you deliver a word of thanks for this forthcoming seminar, which will be held on 20th of uh, May? I immediately responded to him, yes, I will deliver. How can I disobey his word? He is such a potential candidate in our pharma field. Thank you, Josie, for being with us today. Uh, and my thanks are also due to Dr. Anand Nayapa, Mr. Udupa, Mr. Gopal, Mr. Srikant, Mr. Gopinath, Mr. Uh, Ms. Pavitra, and Dr. Nagavi who blessed us with their uh, uh, personal in inspiration of disease procedure. My dear students, never give up until you achieve your dreams and dream big and go for it as long as you can. My dear friends, success is only for, the, only for those who work hard and run till the end. So friends, run your destination with the strong determination. Once again, I thank you all for your attention. Stay at home, stay safe. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. With this, I would like to thank the guests, delegates, and coordinators for patiently listening and for their active participation. Thank you, one and all. Uh, thank you once again, uh, uh, Brian, for your wonderful talk and, uh, you know, making it very successful. And uh, thank you, Carly, for your wonderful interaction. Uh, thank you, friends. Let us catch up very soon uh, with, you know, yeah, one more uh, informative talk. 
and let us make you know pharmaceutical care everywhere it is not only in india but across the world thank you so much thank you thank you thank you brian thank you sir thank you thank you